मेल उ मन हेलो हेलो गोइंग टू स्टार्ट द प्रोग्राम इन फ्यू मिनट्स कपल ऑफ मिनट्स वेलमा वार्ता वार्ता लेनूर पत्तम से अंजम से साथ आगे आगे कंफ्यूजन इधर बात तो नमे पदमूण पदनाव लेक्चर और पदाले तुंगोम नालू मणि चल हाल वो आर मणि की कुक वाला और थ्री फार्टि फै आरमचल मुड़ी पड़ी आना मेल सब मानव सोलवारोम सर कम्यूनिकेशन पोल नैक बट इन विल स्टार्ट द पुरोग्राम इनकी वो मोद पुरोग्राम तमिल तायवा आरमिपा तमिल तायवा पमुर् सयस लक्चर्स इंडस इंडसा और वो श्रीराम कुमार उदलिए मुदल पीएसएल वन वैसा नानूमें और वो कास्मालजी पतावर अद्कूम नोबल पर्स वो इन ग्रूप को हाफ द प्रईस फिफ्टी पर्संट प्रईस वो कास्मालजी बिक तीर सरान मुड़ी से पीपल्स निसिस्ट इन पे 
ரெண்டாவது ப்ரைஸ் வந்து எக்ஸோ பிளானட்ஸ் நம்ம வந்து முன்னாடியிலேருந்தே வந்து பூமியை தவிர வேறு இடத்துல லைஃப் இருக்கா ஏதாவது இடத்துல இருக்க முடியுமா போய் வாழ முடியுமா என்ற கேள்விகள்லாம் இருக்குது அந்த மாதிரி ஒரு கேள்விக்கு பதில் சொல்லக்கூடிய அளவுக்கு இப்பொழுது நமக்கு வந்து ஒரு தொழில்நுட்ப வளர்ச்சி ஏற்பட்டுள்ளது அந்த முறையில் பல வேறு விதமான பல வேறு விதமான முன்னேற்றங்களும் ஏற்பட்டுள்ளன அந்த ரெண்டாவது லெக்சர் அவர் சுஜன் சென்குப்தா அது இந்த இதை வந்து இந்தியன் இன்ஸ்டியூட் ஆஃப் அஸ்ட்ரோ ஃபிசிக்ஸ் அதில் பேராசிரியராக இருக்கிறார் இரண்டு நண்பர்களும் ஆங்கிலத்தில் பேசுவார்கள் ஸ்ரீராமுக்கு கொஞ்சம் தமிழ் தெரியும் நீங்கள் தமிழ் ஏதாவது கேட்டுக்கின்னாக்கா அவர் டெஃபினெட்லி ஹி வில் பி ஏபிள் டு ரெஸ்பாண்ட் கிளியர்லி பட் இஃப் தெர் இஸ் எனி டிஃபிகல்ட்டி யூ கேன் வி வில் ஹெல்ப் மெனி ஆஃப் அஸ் ஆர் ஹியர் வி வில் ட்ரை டு கம்யூனிகேட் டு த ஸ்பீக்கர்ஸ் so that our uh, vandu they are able to answer we will do something about it okay now we will start with uh, tamil thai vaith நம்முடைய கூட்டம் தொடங்குவதற்கு முன்னர் ஒரு இரண்டு அல்ல மூன்று நிமிடங்களுக்கு சிபி பாரத் நம்மளோட தமிழ்நாடு அறிவியல் இயக்கத்தை பற்றியும் துளிர் அண்ட் ஜந்தர் மந்தர் பத்திரிகைகளை பற்றியும் நாங்கள் செய்து கொண்டிருக்கின்ற வேலைகளையும் இப்பொழுது சொல்லுவார் எல்லாருக்கும் வணக்கம் நான் தமிழ்நாடு சயின்ஸ் ஃபாரம்லேருந்து வரேன் தமிழ்நாடு சயின்ஸ் ஃபாரமுடைய ஒரு விங்கு வந்து பிஎஸ்எல் பாப்புலர் சயின்ஸ் லெக்சர் குரூப் வி ஆர் கண்டக்டிங் வேரியஸ் லெக்சர்ஸ் த ரீசன்ட் ட்ரெண்ட் எமர்ஜிங் ட்ரெண்ட் சயின்ஸ் அண்ட் டெக்னாலஜி ஹியர் வி ஆர் கலெக்டிங் வி ஆர் கலெக்டிங் த டிஎன்எஸ் ஆஃப் மெம்பர்ஷிப் அண்டு சயின்ஸ் ஃபாரம் சயின்ஸ் பப்ளிகேஷன்ஸ் துளிர் அண்ட் ஜந்தர் மந்தர் சப்ஸ்கிரிப்ஷன்ஸ் If you are eager to get it, please, uh, the near uh, uh, registration desk we are collecting. Uh, when after the color, uh, uh, event over, please come and do it. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Now the first speaker is um, Dr. Shriram Kumar. Uh, he will, of course, it is here, Department of Physics in Institute of Technology. Uh, he very interestingly as i mentioned he spoke about uh, hawking in the first lecture when we were all there and again it's about cosmology and big bang theory so the thing is most interesting thing is our universe which had started 14 billion years back we do get information about the whole universe in some interesting way and we have got fantastic confirmations it is no longer cosmology in those days people will call it as astrology now they don't say that in fact the developments in uh, measurement accuracy and also prediction theory everything has developed in the last 
40 years uh, when I was actually started as a student from my period itself. So it is an exciting area of uh, physics and um, in India also we have a lot of work that has been done and uh, several people who have come here are experts in this. Now I now invite uh, Dr. Sriram Kumar to speak the first lecture about formation of structure in the universe. It's a technical way in which it is mentioned but it is he is going to explain what for what Peebles has been given the Nobel Prize. Okay, thank you. Thank you, TRG. Um, I had given a talk here and I'm very glad to be back here talking about cosmology. As uh, Professor Govindarajan mentioned, James Peebles of Princeton University um, in New Jersey, USA was awarded one half of the Nobel Prize in Physics for this year for theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology. I should thank uh, uh, the Tamil Nadu Science Forum for giving me an opportunity to give this talk. Cosmology has been I've always felt that cosmology has not been adequately represented in Chennai. I'm always glad to speak about this topic. What is cosmology? Cosmology is the physics of the universe as a whole. As um, Professor Goindrajan was mentioning, over the last hundred years, there has been considerable progress in the scientific understanding of cosmology. In particular, over the last 50 years, since the discovery of something called the cosmic microwave background, which will play a very important role in our story, cosmology has emerged as a precision science. The prevailing model of cosmology, again, it was mentioned by Professor Goindrajan, it's called the hot Big Bang model. Professor James Peebles has made many contributions to this model. Um, if you notice, in contrast to other Nobel Prizes, he was not given for a particular discovery, he has made many significant contributions to this and for these, it is for these theoretical contributions that he has been awarded the Nobel Prize. Evidently, it is very difficult for me to you know, highlight all contributions of Professor Peebles. So I intend to highlight three of the contributions which form a nice narrative for me to tell the story of cosmology, our understanding of the universe as a whole. So this talk does not contain, I think there is just one equation which is easy to understand by, for all the, stu by all the students. Um, apart from that, it is aimed at a very generic audience, in particular students. And uh, what I will try to highlight is Professor Peebles' contribution to understand the structure of the universe as a whole. I want you to appreciate that we are not interested in understanding some part of the universe we see a pattern of the universe as a whole and we would like to understand how this entire pattern has emerged and that is what Professor Peebles' contributions has been. Evidently, we need to understand what the universe contains before we try to understand this. So we will, I will try to provide you with a glimpse of the universe on the larger scales, which is what cosmology is about. And despite the fact, you know, you, this universe seems, you know, hardly changing. The universe is indeed changing with time. It is evolving. The universe is in fact expanding. I will try to explain the idea of this expanding universe. It plays a crucial part in the, our story. Then I will describe the so-called cos cosmic microwave background. It has played a very significant role. It continues to play a very significant role in our understanding of the evolution of the universe. Then I will highlight one of Professor Peebles' primary contribution. I should mention that Professor Peebles was, you know, and his team were actually looking for this cosmic microwave background as it was discovered, you know, by another team of scientists, two scientists, Penzias and Wilson, not far from where they were working. 
I will tell you the story as we go along. And then I will explain the need for something called dark matter. One finds that, you know, almost 30% of the universe today constitutes of 25 to 30% constitutes something called dark matter, which means it doesn't essentially interact with light. I will try to explain why people, why we believe dark matter exists and what was people's contribution in this direction. And then eventually towards the formation of this structure in the universe. Again, to repeat, we are not interested in understanding you know, the structure, the star here or a galaxy here, or not even a clusters of galaxies. We are interested in understanding the pattern of the universe as a whole and whether we can understand from basic physics. And I will close with a summary. Let's start with the universe at large. Where do we begin? Again, we are not interested in local objects that would correspond to astrophysics. We are interested in cosmology. So we need to understand what the universe contains. One of the building blocks of the universe is this idea of a galaxy. I'm sure all of you have heard of the fact that we are part of a galaxy called the Milky Way. And the Milky Way, if you are able to you know, go outside and take a picture of it, it looks something like this. Very much like the Keralaite Appam. There is a bulge in the middle and all these dots correspond to stars. And this picture has been taken. We haven't yet reached beyond our galaxy, hardly, we have reached hardly beyond our solar system. What has been done is that something called a, you know, a cosmic background explorer, a satellite, just exposed this infrared camera to all directions of the sky to arrive at this picture. And what we find is that the galaxy is about 45,000 light years across. A light year, I'm sure you all have heard of, is the distance that light travels in a year. You know the speed of light, which is about 3 times 10 power 5 kilometer per second. You know how many seconds make a year, and you can estimate what a light year in, in terms of the more natural kilometers. Okay? Um, but in, on the larger scales of the universe, in fact, even light years are not adequate. We need to even talk about larger units. We'll come to that in a matter of minutes. So you are something called 15 kiloparsec. A parsec is about 3 light years. This is an accident. It's a unit which is convenient for us because of the solar system that we are in, or rather specifically the Earth and its orbit around the sun. And you should remember a parsec is about 3.26 light years, and kiloparsec is, of course, you know, 10 power 3 parsec, and, you know, the size of our galaxy is about 15 kiloparsec. What is its mass? It contains about 10 power 11 stars such as the sun. But its mass is more than that. This is one of the first hints of something called dark matter. Notice it contains this object here, M with a circle at the bottom with a dot in the center, refers to the solar mass or the mass of the sun, which is 2 times 10 power 30 kilogram. And, you know, those units, kilograms are not convenient units. The mass of the galaxy is about 10 power 12 solar masses or so. This is one of the basic building blocks, but this is, you know, too small an object to understand the universe. What do we have around us? Just as, you know, you have a solar system which has a star and, you know, some planets around it, you may have heard of clusters of stars and, you know, there is a, you know, many large clusters of clusters of stars end up forming a galaxy. Well, galaxies themselves form a group. And we are part, our galaxies form of a local group of about 30 galaxies. And this is one of our nearby galaxies. In fact, there are two satellite galaxies of our own, but those are very small objects. The nearest big galaxy is something called the Andromeda galaxy. There is another galaxy which is not farther away, which is called the Triangulum galaxy or M33. We'll come back to this galaxy later in the story. And the distance to the Andromeda galaxy, which is of a nearby galaxy, is about 700 kiloparsec, or you're talking about, 200, you know, about 2 million light years or so. So there is a large amount of empty space, and there is, you know, these various galaxies are you know, bound due to the gravitational fields of the masses that it contains. So what do you have beyond them? Well, you have a varieties of galaxies. You have, you know, this is the, our own galaxy, will look like this. You have some barred spirals and you have some galaxies which don't have very specific shape. And our universe contains many, many, many such galaxies. And, I'm sorry. And then these galaxies themselves, you know, groups of galaxies 
form a larger group which is called a cluster of galaxies and we the local group which we are a part of is part of a larger group of galaxies called the Virgo cluster and we are at the end of a Virgo cluster and this Virgo cluster about contains about 100 galaxies or so and we are at the edge and the Virgo cluster has a size of about 20 megaparsec. I hope we, you appreciate the distances we are talking about. Mega is of course a million which is about 10 power 6 parsec. Just to remind you a parsec is about 3 light years. We are talking about real large distances and if you look at the sky there are many many galaxies. Each extended object here is a galaxy. And there are many such clusters of galaxy. There is famous coma cluster. There is a Hercules cluster of galaxies which are you know for instance the coma clusters contains a very large plus you know very large number of galaxies about 10 power 3 galaxies or so. So what does the universe contains on even larger scales? Well I'm sorry here is okay I'm very sorry it is changing too fast. <laughs> All right so here is one of the deepest views of, spa in, of space which was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. On the surface of the earth the atmosphere limits the you know how well you can resolve the sky but there is no such limits in the in the atmosphere about the atmosphere which is what Hubble did there was a sp telescope which was sent into space and it captured this image and it is evidently contains a wide array of galaxies I, I hope you appreciate that each extent that object in this uh, in this picture is a galaxy in itself and this even this picture doesn't provide you with the complete picture of the universe so what we need to do is just, just as you survey your globe, which was done about a you know, few hundred years back, you need to survey our universe. So there was many surveys that were taken out. The, I will highlight two surveys and the results they arrived at. So this is one survey. Oh. <laughs> one such survey. Remember, our galaxy looks like the Kerala Tappam. There was an effort to observe the sky to the limits you know, uh, of the telescope that were used to observe north of the galaxy and south of the galaxy. Roughly one square degree in the sky north of the galaxy and one square degree in the south of the galaxy. And for this reason, it is called the 2DF or the two degree field redshift survey. And actually, you know, the survey extends to about 10 power times, 10 power five times more than the, you know, what is illustrated in the picture. How does the universe look at, you know, on the larger scales? Well, it looks something like this. So these are the two different directions. These cones represent the two different directions of the sky, north and south of the galaxy. And I hope you appreciate that each dot here in this picture represents a galaxy. So what do you see? You see a pattern of, you know, structure in the universe. This is what I mean by structure on the larger scales. And our goal is to essentially understand how this all arose. What is the physics? How did eventually these galaxies form or clusters of galaxies this form and there has been this you know survey is a couple of decades old there has been a more systematic survey something called the slow and digital sky survey it has produced a nice video of the how the universe looks on the larger scales I'm just going to play that video for you I'm sorry Okay, the, it consists of one of the most ambitious and influ influential surveys in the history of astronomy and it operated for close to 80 years or so and it observed many many galaxies and many other objects, compact objects called quasars. I'm just going to play a movie for you which illustrates how the universe looks on the larger scales. So what do we have? We have the Milky Way here. What you notice, what you should notice is that there will be two yellow grids that will emerge, one at a distance of two million light years roughly the distance to the Andromeda galaxy okay and another at a billion light years and you know we will see this is about a million light years not two one million light years the Andromeda galaxy is still not in the Andromeda galaxy will start coming in very soon it's largely empty space and as you go further and further So you have the Andromeda coming in. So we are at a, you know, at a radius of about 2 million light years. The speed of the movie, you know, doesn't mean anything. All right. 
and as we go on and you know at larger and larger scales you get to see many many more galaxies as will become evident very soon and what the slow and digital sky survey did was that you know the 2df field observed just one cone and one cone in the south of the galaxy slow and digital sky survey surveyed in a few six seven different directions in the sky and this is what you see okay and the, the different directions will become evident they will rotate this um, um, uh, this picture to illustrate the different directions in which it has been observed don't worry about the different colors what i want you to appreciate each dot here represents a galaxy and this is the pattern of the universe as a whole there are two few different directions in the sky which the uh, you know survey has observed and it has this catalog of galaxies and it is able to you know map the universe to a good extent of course limited by its resolution of the limited by the resolution of the telescopes and the goal is essentially to understand this pattern that you see there is something else that will emerge in a matter of seconds Sorry? Okay, so uh, there is a constraint imposed by the instrument in terms of the resolution. So at the edges, I'll just complete the story and come to you. So what happens, you see a pattern beyond here in terms of blue, yellow and red dots. That will play an important part in our story. We'll come to that in a matter of minutes. And in response to your question, the, the, there is a limitation. You can see that evidently you know there is a limit to which it is observed and you know there are less number of galaxies to an edge rather than in the middle and that is imposed by the you know limitations of the telescope where it is able to observe the brighter ones and unable to observe the less brighter ones i'm sorry i hope that answers your question okay so this is the pattern of the universe what happened to the universe is it static no it is evolving and how do we understand that? In fact, it is expanding. How do we understand that? Well, all we need to do is look at the spectra of galaxies. You have light coming from the galaxies. You just need to send it through a prism and look at the spectrum and it reveals something interesting. So what is a spectrum? I'm sure you have all heard of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this is a typical continuous spectrum. If a body contains many elements and you heat it up, this is the kind of spectrum that you will obtain. If you have specific elements in that body that you are heating up, then it will evidently emit only a discrete wavelengths corresponding to the atom that constitute the element. Or you can have the another situation. You have a, you know, an electromagnetic source far away, light source far away, and there is cool gas in between, and you will see the absorption lines. If you have heard of the front of lines corresponding to the spectra in the sun, you will have corresponding spectral lines which will reflect the elements that constitute the gas. How do the spectra of galaxies look? The galaxies contain very many elements. So this is a typical spectra of some of these, some of the galaxies. And what they will have is that they will have strong emission lines corresponding to certain transitions of elements and a trained astronomer will be able to pick up what these lines correspond to easily and there will be a variety of absorption lines. Now what I can do is that I can compare the spectra from the stars in our galaxy to the spectra of, of far away galaxies. What do you find? You find that they redshift. What does it mean? If the source is receding, right? If this is the spectrum in the source's frame, you know, I have two sources, one which is in my frame, another which is being taken away by my friend in a motorbike, okay? Then what do you see? This is the spectrum that I obtain from the light source in my frame. But if I compare that spectrum with the spectrum of the light source, 
is being taken away in the motorbike by my friend, then what you will find is that the spectrum will be shifted to the red end of the spectrum. Okay? And you can attribute something called a redshift, which essentially reflects the change in the wavelength to the original wavelength. And now you can ask, what is that the galaxies display? What one finds is that the galaxies exhibit something called a redshift. All galaxies, or rather most galaxies, to be precise, exhibit something called redshift. What happens? This is, you know, a spectrum of, a, say, a star or a collection of stars in our galaxy. Okay? And I can compare that spectrum with the spectrum of a galaxy which is some distance away. And another galaxy which is even farther away. And a, a galaxy which is, say, even further away than the previous two. Then what one finds is that, you know, these blue lines indicate a particular transition. You can pick up any transition you like, okay? And you look at a particular transition, like the strong emission line that you observe, what you find is that this red horizontal arrow indicates the extent to which that particular line has been shifted towards the red end of the spectrum as compared to the spectrum from a star in our galaxy. So what you find is that, you know, galaxies exhibit redshift, systematic redshift. And these are actually spectra of four different galaxies from the 2 degree, 2DF redshift survey that I had discussed about earlier. What does this indicate? Well, what one also finds is the following. There is a specific relationship between velocity and the distance of galaxies. The velocity is easy to understand. You know, we had seen this, um, we had seen this, I'm sorry, this seems very sensitive. We had seen this relation, you know, and this, the extent to which the wavelength shifts depends evidently on the velocity of the motorbike which is taking away my friend. And therefore, you know, I can determine the velocity once I know the extent to which a particular, you know, line has shifted to the red end of the spectrum, I can determine its velocity using this redshift z. And I can determine the distance to the galaxy. I have said it very easily, one of the most complicated things to do in cosmology is measuring the distance to a galaxy. It's very non-trivial. If you are interested, you can speak to me later, but for want of time, I will proceed with my story. So you determine the distance to the galaxy and you... Um, <coughs> Okay, you determine the redshift, you know, distance to the galaxy. What has been plotted is velocity obtained from the redshift, okay, and the distance to the galaxy. What one finds is that the larger the distance to the galaxy, the, you know, more faster it seems to be running away from us. Okay, this is a somewhat old picture. In fact, it's almost 100 years old. And this linear relationship between velocity and distance is something called the Hubble's law and it was discovered by Hubble in the middle uh, of 1920s and this is a more modern diagram well it's still 20 years old and what it tells you is that two galaxies you know that are separated by a distance of one megaparsec are moving away from each other at a speed of about 72 kilometer per second what it implies is the following think of the picture okay there are many galaxies and the farther the galaxy, the faster it is moving away. And what it means is that two galaxies, which are separated by one megaparsec, you know, this guy sees this galaxy moving away at a speed of 72 kilometers per second away from him. And this person, you know, sees this galaxy moving away from him at the same speed, which essentially implies that the universe is expanding. Okay? There are important points to understand, you know, Conceptually, what it means in the universe, I will try to clarify in my next slide. The first thing is that the universe is expanding, and the second thing is, you know, it implies that as you run this movie backward, think of all these guys that are moving away, galaxies. If you run this movie backward, it seems to suggest they were all on top of each other at some time early in the past. And this particular notion of time, where all the galaxies seem to have been on top of each other, is something that is referred to as the Big Bang. 
And uh, Professor Govindrajan mentioned a certain number, namely the age of the universe. He said it's about 14 billion years old. And this is easy to understand from this speed. Notice it is kilometer per second per megaparsec. Okay, which is essentially the slope of this curve. And this, you know, has units of one over time. I would, if you are a student interested in carrying out this calculation, I would urge you to cal invert this and estimate a time scale. And that time scale you will find that will be of the order of 14 billion years or so that Professor Govindrajan mentioned. And another point to highlight is that notice, you know, this red box here, you know, is the original Hubble plot. This is a more modern plot. In fact, you know, there are modern plots which has been able to obtain this, you know, Hubble diagram for even larger distances. There are a couple of points I need to clarify. How do you visualize this expansion of the universe? And what is this redshift? Now, I have given this idea that these galaxies are moving away. And there is, because it is moving with a certain velocity, there is a Doppler effect, which is what we see as redshift of galaxies. This actually is an incorrect picture. On these larger scales in the universe, the Newtonian gravity you would have learned at school is, is inadequate to explain the physics of the universe on these scales. At greatest strengths and larger scales, Newtonian gravity fails. And it has to be replaced by a superior theory known as Einstein's general theory of relativity. And it is in this context you have to understand this idea of redshift. In Einstein's relativity, the universe, you know, is described by, you know, uh, by something, notion of space and time, space, time, okay? And the way you should imagine is there is a, you can think of the universe as the surface of a balloon, okay? And as you blow the balloon, the balloon expands. What it means is that on the surface of the balloon, if you put two dots, you know, like these yellow patches, the distance between them increases with time. And what you can show is that if you have such a geometry, expanding geometry, if you leave a photon in this geometry, it will lose energy. And that is what you see as redshift. And it is actually not a Doppler effect. It is convenient for me to introduce the idea, but it is something called a cosmological redshift. You should understand, if I leave an object in this universe, because of the fact that the universe is expanding, it will lose energy whether it is a photon or even, you know, particle with some mass. So, the universe contains many objects. It is expanding. It evidently contains matter. Does it contain anything else? Evidently, it contains radiation. You see light from the stars. That is how you actually observe the galaxies. Okay? One of the important things that we recognized over the last 50 years that, you know, the dominant form of radiation in the universe is not the light from the stars. We find that we are bathed in a thermal distribution of radiation. And this is known as the cosmic microwave background. And this is where, you know, the people's contributions and the people's story comes in. In the, you know, the, as I mentioned, the idea of the expanding universe, general relativity was formulated in 1915. In the mid-1920s, we have begun to realize that the universe is expanding. And between 1920 and 1950, 1960, there was a lot of, you know, effort in trying to understand what happened in the early universe if the universe is expanding. And it was recognized that the early universe would have been hot, okay, and there would have been radiation, and this radiation should be seen in the sky. And in fact, in the middle of 1960s, Peebles and his group at Princeton University, you know, there was a person by name uh, Dickey who was, you know, who was good at, you know, um, designing instruments and someone by name Wilkinson, whom we will encounter again later in the story, were trying to design a radiometer, something to observe, but, you know, this, temp this radiation in the sky. There are reasons to believe that this radiation will be thermal, just as the spectrum, you know, as you heat a body, okay, will be thermal in nature, but what was not very well known was the temperature of this radiation. It was estimated to be of the order of 5 to 10 degree, and in fact, Peebles was the theoretician who was helping calculate these quantities, and there were these experimenters at, you know, Princeton University 
who are trying to, you know, actually deep measure this radiation. Meanwhile, what happened was as follows. There were two people, Penzias and Wilson, who were at Bell Labs, and they happened to have an antenna, okay, which, you know, measures at this microwave, you know, which is sensitive to these microwave frequencies, and what they were doing is that they were just trying to measure the radiation from the galaxy, okay? I showed you a picture of a galaxy which looked like that Kerolite Appam. Think of the galaxy at the center and the universe around it, okay? And the galaxy lies here. And they were trying to measure the radiation from the galaxy in certain region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And what they found was that, you know, there was a noise which was refusing to go away. They, then they cleaned up the apparatus, okay? In fact, there was a famous story where there were two DAOs there which were repeatedly coating the apparatus with the dielectric substance, okay? They were pooping on the uh, apparatus very regularly and they cleaned it up and tried to measure this radiation again and they found that there was this noise which was refusing to go away. And they had no clue what this was about. And just a few kilometers away, there was people, you know, these are the two papers in the Astrophysical Journal. There were people, Dickey, Peebles, Roll, and Wilkinson were actually trying to construct an apparatus to measure exactly this radiation. And, uh, you know, there was a phone call. There is a famous story of a phone call from Penzias and Wilson to one of members of the group, I believe Dickey, and, you know, who said that we have been scooped. And in fact, Penzias and Wilson, for their discovery, won the Nobel Prize in 1978, and people won this year. Okay? So this is, you know, actually, I just caught a glimpse. This is the paper by Penzias and Wilson, and this is a paper by these four people at Princeton University, you know, which explains why there should be a cosmic black body radiation or thermal radiation which has been observed by Penzias and Wilson. So this is the sky, I'm sorry, I should go back. I should. So this is the sky, the CMB sky, okay? We will see, begin to see more patterns in this and they will form an imp important part in our story. And this temperature, as I will describe, is about 3 Kelvin or so. So this temperature comes from all directions in the sky. Okay? And this is the paper I had already mentioned. And so what Penzias and this is the black body spectrum at a temperature of about 2.7 Kelvin or so. And this is what Penzias and Wilson observed. And what has since happened? Well, we have. <sighs> okay. This is a more modern version of that spectrum where people have observed a wide range of wavelengths. Okay? This is the spectrum of background radiation in all different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, you know, ranging from you know, very small wavelengths to very large wavelengths here. And notice it peaks in something called the microwave region of the spectrum. And as I will describe, it is cosmic in origin. It's everywhere which means it's a part of the universe. It was not created by a small event here or there in the universe. And it is for that reason, it's called a cosmic background. It's in the, it peaks in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And for this reason, it's called the cosmic microwave background. And this, you know, this is where that spectrum is. And this has been measured, you know, very exquisitely by a satellite called satellite called Kobe, all right? We will again encounter the satellite later, and this is the actual thermal spectrum. The dots with error bars are the observations, or the measurements, and uh, this curve corresponds to this 2.725 Kelvin, okay? And what I should emphasize is this, these error bars have been enlarged by 400 times so that they are visible in this graph. In other words, it is one of the most perfect black body spectrum you will encounter. So what does this imply? This implies that the universe, apart from matter, it also contains radiation that was clear from, you know, light from the stars and galaxies, etc. But those don't constitute the dominant form of radiation. The dominant form of radiation is the so-called cosmic microwave background. And if you use general relativity and the fact that universe is expanding, what one can show is the following, 
that the universe began in a hot, dense state. You know, I, if you are a young student, okay, who watches American sitcoms, you may know this guy called Sheldon, who is this uh, theoretical physicist who appears in this you know, sitcom called the Big Bang Theory, and this is the first screen, you know, this is the first screen that appears as the sitcom starts, and it starts with the statement of a universe, what in a hot, dense state. So you have matter, you have radiation, and using general relativity, you can immediately argue that very early in the universe, the universe started in a hot, dense state. It cooled down as it expanded, and this is actually the origin of the CMB. And let me quickly explain what the CMB is. So what you have is as follows. What you have is as follows. This bath here, you know, yellow bath, corresponds to the photons in the universe. Okay? And these are matter. This large ball are protons. This small balls are electrons. Very early in the universe, the universe is hot. Okay? And the photons had a large amount of energy. As a result, you know, if an electron tries to combine with a proton and form an atom, this photon will knock off the electron and the electrons will remain free. But as the universe cools, what happens is that atoms form. Here is a hydrogen atom, here is a new, you know, um, helium atom with two neutrons and two protons. The big green balls are, pro I'm sorry, are neutrons and the red ones, as I already mentioned, are protons and it forms a helium atom. And notice what happens is that these, you know, photons start streaming freely. This is the early part of the universe, this is the late part of the universe, and the photons start streaming freely, and in fact, they travel from that time to us, virtually uninterrupted, very much in a manner, what you see is that, you know, you, if you have a cloud here, what happens is that there are photons which have a very small mean free path. They are constantly scattered by the water molecules in the crowd, but once they cross this part, it travels to you freely, and that is what these photons do. They have a very short mean free path, very early in the universe, but once the temperature cools down to a certain extent, okay, by a certain extent, the photons start tra traveling freely and reach you, which is what you observe as the CMB. And you can, you know, in other words, you see the CMB in all directions in the sky. Just as the surface of the earth can be, you know, projected on this ellipse, you can project the entire sky on this ellipse, and we will see this projection in the CMB. This is the projection I had shown earlier, if you recall. And that earlier projection, as observed by Penzias and Wilson, had no pattern at all. But we, you know, we, more modern measurements are beginning to see patterns. And this takes us to the second part of the story. And these are, you know, what I find is that the temperature of the CMB, I said it's about 2.725 Kelvin today. And it is largely the same. At, until the third or the fourth decimal place, but if you go to the fifth decimal place, what you see is that beginning to see deviations in temperature. In other words, the temperature in this direction of the sky, if it is 2.72543, here it could be 2.72548, for instance. There are one part in 10 power 5 deviations, and in fact, it is these deviations which are responsible for all the structures in the universe, and therefore, you and me. Okay, so the second part of the story goes to the idea of dark matter. Why do we need dark matter? It's easy to understand. We have already seen, hmm, it's very sensitive. We have already seen how there exist spiral galaxies. In fact, we had seen this triangulum galaxy earlier in the, in the slide. This is this galaxy. Okay, this is the galaxy on the right hand side here. Okay, now what you try to do is that this is the galaxy that has been displayed as a background. You try to measure, you know, I can easily measure using redshift of the spectra as I've already indicated. You try to measure the velocity with which the galaxy is rotating from the center of the galaxy to farther away. Now, if there was only matter present, you know, the visible matter that is present in the galaxy and nothing else is present, what you find is that the velocity, you know, on these scales, the Newtonian physics is adequate to describe the dynamics, 
and we can use Newtonian physics and this is actually the famous Keplerian curve and if you think that there was matter only here then what you find is that the galaxy you know velocity should have dropped by like this but what you actually find is the velocity keeps increasing with distance from the center of the galaxy what it means is that there should be matter present beyond this visible region and the modern view is that this where people's contributed greatly is to understand that the galaxy is embedded in a halo of dark matter and this is what this paper highlights okay there's a paper by you know Ostriker and Peebles which was written in the mid 70s which you know indicates the fact that the galaxies are embedded in a larger halo of cold what is referred to as cold dark matter dark it's called dark matter because it doesn't interact with light and therefore you can't see it directly okay and what you find is that you know what you find is that if you want to explain these rotation curves you need to have this dark matter present you know which extends to greater distances than what the, where you see the visible matter. In other words, there is a huge dark matter halo which surrounds these galaxies. The dark matter creates a potential. You know that matter creates a gravitational field. It creates a gravitational potential which others fall and that is what cold dark matter does. And there are various evidences for dark matter. This is, you know, something called gravitational lensing. You know, in the, in the modern uh, language, what you have is that you have a foreground galaxy, which is a large, luminous red galaxy, which has a huge mass. And there is a blue galaxy in the background. What has happened is that gravity bends light. And therefore, you know, you have a faraway galaxy. You have a huge mass in the middle, just like a lens. What it does is that it takes lights from different directions and converges towards me. And that is what you see as this famous Einstein ring. And it again indicates the presence of dark matter much beyond the extent of the visible region of this intervening galaxy. And there is yet another, uh, yet another observation. I will try, you know, for want of time, I will not spend on this. Okay. It's a famous bullet cluster. If you're interested, I can speak to you later. Now, these are local effects. What is the cosmological evidence for dark matter? Well, this is where Peebles contributed as well. You know, I mentioned about the CMB. I also indicated that the CMB has anisotropies. To a first, third, or fourth decimal place, the temperature of the CMB is the same in all directions of the sky. But you measure at the fifth decimal place, there are deviations in the temperature, as I had indicated to one part in 10 power 5 or so. Now, the question is, how did these, you know, deviations, anisotropies arise, and what is the cause of this? And this is where Peebles' third contribution came in, okay? And he was able to explain as to how dark matter is essential to understand these patterns. This is a more modern version of the CMB sky. This was by Kobe, which I had mentioned. And if you observe the sky with greater and greater resolution, you begin to see these patterns in the CMB sky. And this is the full sky as observed by WMAP. In fact, the WMAP is named after, W is named after Wilkinson, who was one of the four people who were trying to observe as Penzias and Wilson scooped them. Okay, and there has been exquisite measurement of these anisotropies over the last decade or so by a measurement called, by an instrument called Planck, which has observed the CMB sky from, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in an orbit beyond, <coughs> you know, from the sky, okay, and what one finds is that you need this dark matter in order to explain this pattern of anisotropies. The last part is you know, what we had started with. You know, I had shown this picture of the universe as a whole. Can we understand this? Unfortunately, what happens is that it is not, it is very complicated dynamics because you are talking about millions and millions of galaxies whose dynamics you need to evolve. And what happens is that it turns out to be a very nonlinear system. Linear systems are easy to solve. The universe in this regime, where they are, you know, where they are interacting strongly, is a non-linear system. So, therefore, it is difficult to solve using simple tools and mathematics. You have to turn to a computer to simulate 
whether you know how these particles evolve how these galaxies evolve through the interactions and that has been done and what I will show you know conclude you know I will conclude in the next five minutes or so what I will try to show is these results from these computer simulations and what I will try to impress upon you is the results of these computer simulation match the pattern of the sky with these dots of galaxies that I had shown earlier. So I'll just skip this slide. So what I'm going to show is the following. So think of this pattern, okay? Okay, I'm just going to, just bear with me. So think of this pattern. It's a largely smooth distribution of dots, okay? But the, evidently, there has been some tiny deviations from a very smooth distribution, okay? Think of the universe where you know there were masses present dots present which represent maybe a small collection of objects okay and there are some you know deviations from smoothness what one finds is that if there are deviations from smoothness gravity will take over if you have a distribution of masses even if there is a sm smallest of deviation from smoothness what will happen is that where this deviation exists you know the masses will accumulate and will start forming larger and larger structures this is how actually the structure this we see around in the universe has been you know has been created and the large scale structure that i mentioned about and this set of slides that i'm going to show you will illustrate if i start with small you know disturbances like this and i allow them to evolve through gravitational interactions how they will evolve So as time evolves, what you see is that the masses, you know, accumulate and they form this pattern, which are very similar. This, for instance, could be a large collection of galaxies. Okay, this is a glimpse of what can happen. There has been a major computer simulation, which I will try to play in a matter of minutes. Okay, so there was a huge run, okay, the computer with about a 10 power. 10 billion particles, okay, over a large region of the universe, and this is what the result is. So you can see this pattern. You're talking about this is the entire universe as a whole. This is the result of a computer simulation which ran for, you know, in a very large computer for almost a month or so, and you are talking about something like 500 megaparsec. What they are trying to do is that this is the result of the simulation. They are trying to zoom in and try to give you a picture of what has happened. Now you can begin to see what you, you know, that there is a gravitational field that is formed originally due to dark matter that I had mentioned about in the uh, few minutes back. And then visible matter falls in. As visible matter falls in, it heats up and it starts emitting light. And this is the kind of pattern that you saw in that survey that I had seen earlier. And Peebles was one of the earliest people to actually run computer simulations to understand the formation of structures in the universe. As I mentioned, he also played a significant role in helping us understand the role of dark matter in the formation of structure. So they are now zooming out to the eventual result that you have. And this pattern that you see is supposed to look very similar to the pattern of the survey that I had shown earlier. So I'm almost towards the end of my talk, so I'll just quickly summarize. So this is the view of the universe that we have currently. The universe began with a big bang and it was a very hot, short phase. And this is where, this is the pattern of the anisotropies in the CMB that I talked about. Okay? And there is something called the dark ages. What has happened is that the galaxies of, I'm sorry, the structure is forming, but stars haven't yet formed to emit light. So there are dark ages here, which people are beginning to understand today. As time went on, the first stars formed, they started emitting light, 
and eventually galaxies form and Peebles contributed as I already described to the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation. I do not know what could have happened if Penziard and Wilson did not have someone to explain to them that they have seen this cosmic microwave background radiation. There have been history of people observing the CMB through other means much prior to Penzias and Wilson. So Peebles played a significant role. As I mentioned, he also played a role in understanding the structures of galaxies and the you know, role played by cold dark matter in forming these galaxies. And he has actually played a significant role in our understanding of the structure that we see around us today, okay, over these distances. In fact, very, if you notice this tube, it reflects how the universe expands. The universe expands through a very large period here and then it slows down and then you can see that the universe begins to expand through an accelerated fashion. It is driven by something called dark energy and Peebles has played a role in under our understanding of dark energy as well. He has models, you know, uh, which are not necessarily supported by data, okay, and, uh, you know, but for want of time I couldn't spend time on those aspects. <coughs> So let me summarize, Peebles has contributed to arrive at this standard model of cosmology. What it says is that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. What it means is that we saw that there were patterns of galaxies, but if you look at a sufficiently large region of the sky, and if you take a sphere of, of the order of, you know, with a radius of the order of 100 megaparsec or so, what one finds is that independent of where you place the sphere, the amount of matter in the universe is roughly the same, okay? You know, another point, baryons, that is what you and me are made of, actually contribute to less than 5% of the total density of the universe. And I mentioned about 25% of the universe today constitutes something called dark matter. And I highlighted people's role in our understanding of cold dark matter. What I could not spend time on is, you know, quantum fluctuations. This is what I had talked about in my first talk in the Tamil Nadu Science Forum, how quantum fluctuations are what created those anisotropies in the CMB, okay? And uh, these anisotropies in the CMB, which, you know, eventually turned due to gravitational instability. So I showed you this small pa you know, pattern with small disturbances in the pattern, in this distribution of matter. And those small disturbances are adequate to eventually through gravitational instability, your good old gravitational force, you know, to lead to the structures, this pattern of structures that we see around us today. With those remarks, I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Shriram. Uh, please take your seat. Uh, we'll go for the questions after the second talk. Uh, Shriram gave a fantastic talk on uh, how the universe originated 14 billion years back. And he made it very clear what we know as we do experiments here is only 5% of the matter. Protons, neutrons and other things, stars which we see, all the things you add up, all of them which you see, okay, is only 5%. Another 25%, they are all with us, here, everywhere, they are dark matter. We don't even know. They don't interact with us and it is responsible for the galaxies, the galaxy formation. Without that, we can't understand, unlike the Keplerian law, where the farther you go, the velocity of the planets decrease. But unfortunately, in the galaxies, the farther you go, they don't decrease. The star's velocity don't decrease. So the Kepler's laws cannot be applied in this thing. And that is what forced people to think that there is something more there everywhere which is not interacting with us. And the most interesting thing is the gravity is among the first force which was discovered is also the most awe-inspiring extraordinary from Newton and then Einstein, the space-time and then you think of that as kind of a rubber sheet and then there is some bulge somewhere. That kind of a thing 
which uh, structures which are coming in space time which are making it very interesting so now uh, we are going to have dr sujan sen gupta from indian institute of astrophysics uh, he will talk to us about the exoplanets the so we were always wondering is there life beyond earth okay is there life beyond earth wherever can we see or even we try to send signal or they will send signal to us in fact he talked to us yesterday in our institute uh, search for unintelligent life he is actually looks like he is worried if the life is very intelligent more than us they will kill us so it's better that it be unintelligent so that we can kill them so now dr sujan sen gupta he has a book also he will probably explain that mention it towards the end and uh, people can, will find this uh, talk very interesting and the origin of the search for exoplanets you will understand as he mentions started here in madras okay thank you thank you professor govind raju for a nice introduction good afternoon everybody and uh, it's uh, not only a pleasure but uh, i feel uh, honored to be here uh, sorry uh, i feel uh, honored to be here uh, um, among you to give my uh, lecture now i think most of you or all of you have uh, read uh, science fiction where you have come through alien life the intelligent life either we are going or invading and uh, you have definitely watched the movies like et interstellar uh, avatar etc etc today i am going to tell you the systematic scientific search for uh, life now why do we need to search for uh, um, exo planet or exo world or why do we need to search for life that is because we human are uh, this is uh, not here let me see why ha huh. yeah so that, that is because we are curious to know if anybody out there uh, or we uh, we are uh, the lonely play uh, we are the only uh, um, life in this uh, earth or if life is a common phenomenon in the now <clears throat> when usually you talk about uh, search for life we have the concept that uh, we uh, about intelligent life all the science fiction books and everything that is concerned about intelligent life what is this intelligent life so we all human being are considered to be intelligent you may say that uh, biologist uh, also say that simians are uh, intelligent or the monkeys are intelligent even the octopus um, they are also intelligent the environmentalist can also tell that the ants are also intelligent but we cannot detect uh, intelligent species outside the solar system unless and until it can generate electromagnetic wave artificially can uh, transmit it or can receive it in that way we acquire this technology of generating or receiving electromagnetic wave just 150 years ago so our signal has passed only 150 light years distance now if we want to detect life from the uh, very corner of the uh, of, of our galaxy so um, that will uh, be another 25000 light year that means that civilization has to be 25000 uh, year old civilization so <clears throat> today i am not going to tell you about the search for intelligent life but rather i am going to tell you the search for life whatever kind intelligent or in, in unintelligent nascent bacteria uh, uh, plants everything this is the problem not just uh, now we know one planet very well that is our mother earth that is our world and uh, as soon as the uh, thousand old aristotelian concept of a <coughs> geocentric earth was uh, abandoned <coughs> this concept was there 
earth was in the center and Copernicus theory of centric earth was established um, where we know that the earth is orbiting around the sun along sibling the other seven planets the speculation some of the scholars have started thinking that if that is the case then all the billions and millions of lights in the night sky are also sun and in that case they may also have planets if that is the case then there may be some planets which are very similar to our earth and if that is the case if earth like planets exist elsewhere then there could be life so <coughs> the, that life may originated from such type of consideration but then the people uh, many people uh, with whatever technology they have the telescope they have they searching for planet it was not so easy thing and nobody could uh, report any uh, um, or any evidences finally in 1885 uh, an astronomer from very city in one observatory called madras observatory for the first time reported in a journal called monthly notice of royal astronomical society the first of a planet outside a solar system this madras observatory was established in 1786 by the british east india company before that it was in madras egmore as a uh, uh, private observatory the british uh, um, uh, east india company took up it to do the star and in uh, 1800 next captain william stephen jacob was the director from 1848 to 1959 by using a small telescope 6 inch telescope and 8 inch telescope he modeled the movement the position uh, from the position of two stars in a binary system called 70 opiochi he predicted the movement of the stars that these two stars are not following exactly the kepler's law in that he suggests if there is a planetary mass object as a third object orbiting any of the stars or uh, system then that could explain it immediately after the paper was published in 1955 observer from chicago university also supported his claim for 50 years nobody challenged this thing but after the telescope has improved found that this was actually a false alarm he made a mistake because he consider much about the atmospheric effect but at that time this thought that a planet can explain the motion of a binary star was far far ahead of that time and then subsequently created um, uh, and uh, observation for detection continued now this madras observatory what happened there in 1893 the madras is got mean and then the british thought that uh, it is not worth of monitoring the star rather it is uh, um, it is worth to study the sun because that causes the pain so they wanted to shift this observatory to kodaikanal observatory and then uh, it has gone uh, the next one and so this madras observatory was shifted to kodai canal that is also in tamil nadu and it becomes completely a center for the research of uh, 1971 it was it came under uh, central government department of science and technology under the indian institute of astrophysics at the same time another observatory uh, which can study the stars galaxies and other thing came out in another part of tamil nadu and that is in uh, kavalur <coughs> that is also in tamil nadu here you can see that this is the so far the asia's largest optical observatory it has still asia's largest optical telescope a 2.4 meter optical telescope called vainubappu telescope there are many other telescope and captain jacob uh, started from madras observatory we people uh, they are with the astronomer i and my group 
they continue by using this telescope for new world, the search for new exoplanet. In any case, after that, after this motivated work by Captain Jacob, uh, many people attempted, but all were all were turned to be false alarm. Finally, in 1995, this gentleman, Michel Mayor, and his PhD student, D.R. Quill, reported the first discovery of a planet around a certain type of star. This uh, paper in, uh, in the October of 1995, immediately within one month, a group led by Geoffrey Marse confirmed that what they have got is correct. They have also got uh, the same result, giving it the first, the status of the first confirmed planet around a solar type of star, so outside our solar system, and awarded after 25 years the Nobel Prize. So here is the uh, uh, star, you can see, see that star, he dis, uh, that planet he has discovered around this star in the Pegasus uh, constellation. But clearly if you see that even, even through a very large telescope, the star will appear like a point, point object. The planets, they don't, emit, they don't have their own emission, so they emit uh, the star light and they are hidden by the intense uh, light of the star. So it is not possible to detect such type of planets outside the solar system by uh, direct method. Uh, Michel and Didier did it, said indirect method. And what is that method? So now that is called a Doppler radial velocity method, or which was proposed in 1952. Now when, if you have a um, binary star, they don't rotate around anybody's center. Rather, they are, uh, rotate around a common point, which is called the pericenter. Now, <clears throat> if the mass of, if one of this component, one of this uh, star, pericenter moves towards the heavier star. So now, what will be happen if planet orbits a star, this pericenter uh, will go inside the star, but not exactly the center of the star. As the star will ubul. It will go towards you or it will go away from you or it will just ubul in which direction watching it. So what they do that the astronomer passes the star light through this prism is called the instrument is called the spectrograph. I think the previous speaker has nicely explained this spectrum. So when you pass to the spectrum, uh, the light, the starlight through a spe spectrograph, <coughs> you notice certain lines, uh, vertical dark line, which are the signature of the matter present in the outer layer of the star. The star is absorbed by this material and that causes this uh, line and each line can be distinguishable by their position in the entire spectrum. Now if the star moves, towards you or away from you, that causes the shift wavelength. So uh, already, already it is dis uh, discussed in the last uh, um, lecture that uh, there is a shift when it moves uh, towards the blue, when it moves you, that the source of the star and it is at the rest, if there is no movement and it moves towards uh, away if uh, towards the red side, if it is away from this is called the Doppler red shift or Doppler blue. Shift. Doppler actually it uh, for sound wave, but then later on it was found that this is applicable for the light uh, wave also. And is this Doppler shift plays a very important role in astronomy? So now, what's the situation here when planet orbits a star? So here it moves around uh, the, the star, the star ubuls, as a result, the line that shifts from blue to red to red to blue from the center, and this happens periodically. If you convert it into the velocity, you can get the motion of the um, star. So this is the radial velocity method. This method uh, uh, 
<coughs> was followed in the beginning and by the miss missile and ddr actually our jupiter it radial velocity to the sun about 12.7 meter per second our earth also imparts a radial velocity to the sun but that is only 10 centimeter per second now at the time this method was proposed the existing instrument could uh, detect only if the radial velocity of the star was 1 kilometer per second now missile and uh, ddr they developed a sophisticated instrument that is called lod which could detect radial velocity of the star as small as 7 meter per second because they thought that the planets will be in the jupiter position or uh, then uh, jupiter size of planet or jupiter position can be detected and then targeted the list of stars so this is ddr and then fortunately for them they found out the radial velocity of the star 15 pegasi Uh, Pegasi as 56 uh, about 56 meter per second, and this was when transferred into the velocity, they get a very perfect periodic movement in the uh, in the star's uh, radial velocity, and that confirms the presence of the planet, the first planet around the solar system, and it was named as 51 Pegasi B. E. Now, up in, uh, for the next five years. quite a few group develop sophisticated instrument the spectrograph and try to detect many planets and many planet was discovered uh, discovered through this method at about 100 or 200 planet has been discovered by using this radial velocity method but then in 1999 planet was discovered by using another method and that is called the transit method so just on 11th number you have heard or uh, some of you might have seen the video nasa at mercury is transiting across the sun so this photo was taken in iis uh, setup transit of venus in june uh, 6 2012 Here you can see that the shadow of venus is falling over the disk of the sun and this makes sign change brightness of the star if the planet is much near to the star if it is much larger then detectable amount of drop or reduction or is in the brightness of the star and that principle is used by the astronomer to detect large exoplanet which are very near to the star so when the planet transit across the star there is a systematic drop in its uh, the brightness of the star and this becomes perfectly <coughs> periodic so in future also uh, we use this method although this method is simple in principle but is a very tedious method because you have to uh, reduce the dark you have to remove the atmosphere effect everything and then you have to model and fit it this uh, method become so popular that it from european southern observatory uh, european space agency to launch a dedicated space craft korot in 2006 uh, sequent in 2009 in nasa send a um, nasa send a space probe dedicated space probe that is called that is called kepler so as soon as kepler was launched hundred of thousands of uh, stars having planet has been discovered and our entire concept of the planets planetary properties planetary formation got into change and before that even the discovery of 100 uh, planets their properties were so different that that prompted the parliament of astronomer that is called the international astronomical union to sit down to vote and uh, define the definition of uh, the planet the properties of planet as a consequence pluto lost its uh, status of being a planet i think many of you know that story so before the before kepler was launched we knew only uh, eight planets <coughs> and the largest planet and the heaviest planet was jupiter which were far away from the uh, sun the rocky planet which were very near to the sun but once kepler discovered hundreds and thousands of planets we saw that planets uh, of 
larger planet larger than uh, jupiter and be 10 times more heavier than jupiter exist around and orbiting around other stars and also they are so near that they are very hot even they are so hot an iron or gold can also melt in their atmosphere there are many other, other kind of planet which has a extensive atmosphere and there is a, a small rocky core these are called mini neptunian not present in our solar so maybe this is the transition from a rocky planet and a planet like jupiter so the diversity in the planets and their properties has gone beyond our imagination now i will show you a few outstanding we have discovered the first one here you see a planet is discovered is orbiting two stars this is called circumbinary planets in fact our nearest star proxima century it has a planet now, proxima century star in a binary system stellar system it has two older brothers alpha century a and alpha century b this planet is orbiting around the uh, youngest uh, the smallest uh, star proxima century so imagine how the climate of these planets how the day and the night of these planets are uh, governed by the light of the three stars same time we discover planets which has no parents they are just, uh, rogue planets most possibly they were the uh, member of a stellar family but they were somehow detached during their uh, immediately after their formation they are moving uh, alone and uh, they are young that's why they are hot sufficiently hot so that we can directly image them and uh, we can uh, see that they are actually planetary star at least 6 to 7 such type of rogue planet or uh, 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 planets without parents have discovered so far in future many more uh, is about to discover then another outstanding we came to know and that is uh, about the diamond <coughs> planet now how diamond planet can there be a planet made of of diamond can be a planet surface will be made of diamond so that it will be reflecting in the uh, galaxy in in the inside now how diamonds are uh, formed diamonds are form diamonds are allotrope of carbon so in the interior of the earth due to the high pressure and high temperature the carbon form a particular a, a specific lattice and that becomes diamond now through volcanic effect these diamonds come out from the interior of the planet now when the solar system was born it was born the self gravitational collapse of massive cloud that initial cloud that has equal amount of means almost uh, half of the uh, carbon than oxygen solar system is oxygen rich and that's why we see most of the oxide in our planet like uh, silicate oxide which makes our uh, rock like water like carbon dioxide these are plenty but if the star forming cloud has equal amount of carbon and oxygen then instead of oxide there will be more carbide more carbon molecules more carbon uh, related um, compound now if this the planet is as a result the star will be carbon rich these are carbon rich star so its planets will also be carbon rich because the planets are formed from the same material the star is formed now if this this carbon star it is very near to its star and so its temperature is very high then this carbon may convert into diamond on the other hand if it is far away but because of the tremendous pressure in the inside its entire uh, core can become a diamond now if this diamond star uh, will be appropriate place where water can sustain it if there is life this type of planet then this will be the owner of an entire diamond planet but the only problem will be there who delivered the planet to us at the same time we discovered planet which has no reflectivity 
completely means almost dark. You do not know so far that what, of, what type of materials it consists of. This is very near to the star, but it's reflecting very less. So, uh, uh, is albedo which uh, de uh, de define the reflectivity is so less that it's a very faint object. It was uh, discovered by indirect method, but on uh, uh, got the uh, its and, uh, the reflectivity, and it one still wonder us that what type of material made this uh, planet so dark. Now you see that here another planet which is so near, and so this is the hottest planet in our galaxy so far. It is so near to a uh, star, the star itself brighter than uh, our sun, a brighter than our sun, and uh, the planet is so near that it is shredding its mass, mass towards the star. And as a result, it becomes an oblate shape, just like a rugby ball shape. So it is uh, deviated heavily from city. Now these all planets are, uh, these all images are artist uh, rendition. They are all reflected planets, they are all detected um, indirectly. But at the same time, the astronomer has imaged some of the planets, and you can see this is a system, it's called in, uh, 33B, where the four planet has been imaged, covered by an instrument called coronagraph. Now, these planets, the star system itself is very young. They are less than 100 million years old. So, therefore, the planets are still collapsing. As a consequence, they are emitting copious of uh, um, energy radiation that comes through the conversion of gravitational potential energy and so they are very bright in the infrared. So this, are, this picture has been taken uh, uh, in infrared, Pizjar uh, space telescope and you can see one, two, three, four planets, the real image of uh, planets outside the solar system. So the problem is here where I have started by telling that this is a search for exo, but the uh, where is, is life, if life exists elsewhere. So far what I have told you, variety of planets that we have discovered in, uh, in our to get a viable answer of that question. So I will move to that uh, question, to where, where is uh, no, those planets? Where life is, where life will. Now, where to search for that? So, actually, we can uh, search habitable planet, planetary system around any star, but in a particular position around that star. And that position is called the habitable zone, the circumstellar habitable zone. So, this is a uh, region around a star where the temperature will be approved for water to exist in liquid state. So that is called the habitable. This habitability is on various conditions. First of all, the, the energy of the star or the brightness of the star accordingly the distance moves around. So this is the sun, this is our sun and uh, you can see that the earth is in the middle of the habitable zone. It's also determined from the reflectivity of the planet and uh, from the composition of the atmosphere that determines the effect. I am not the details of uh, that. So the search, the focus shifted finding out planets in the habitable zone of the so Among all the planets detected, we found a planet in the habitable of a star this is given Kepler 22 around the star Kepler 22. It is in a region of a star where water can in the liquid state. But then it found it was determined that the planet is actually much larger than the Earth. So it cannot be a rocky planet. It uh, will be very similar to Neptune. Uh, so it is a gaseous planet. Therefore, even if water exists, the it liquid water on its surface because the surface is, uh, doesn't have a rocky uh, place to keep the water. 
Now at the same time, Kepler, Kepler discovered Kepler 20, where these two planets, Kepler 20e and Kepler are just like Earth in size and also in mass, and therefore it is inferred that these are the rocky planets. But unfortunately, these two rocky planets were uh, very near to the, their uh, star, and so therefore their temperature is 1400 degree Fahrenheit to and is 800 degree Fahrenheit, and they are so hot that they are really uh, and if not uh, art. So art continues. So the two condition that we needed that determined is a rocky planet in a uh, circumstellar zone where temperature will be appropriate for water to exist in uh, liquid state. So Kepler and many other telescopes, they have discovered a few uh, such type of planet which are rocky and uh, uh, which are in the habitable uh, zone. But the question is now, is it uh, sufficient? This is rocky and uh, uh, they have appropriate temperature or they are in the habitable zone. Is it sufficient for origin and for the supporting or for protecting life or uh, is, uh, <clears throat> what are the conditions for life to uh, really habitate in a planet? So then you move into a more fundamental question, what is life? Now the problem is that there is no definition of life because life is a So what is the definition there? Suppose 100 years ago somebody asked what is water, described it. Oh, water is a liquid, it is colorless, it is orderless, it goes from up to down. But then somebody will bring a beaker of uh, ethyl alcohol or methyl alcohol and tell that look this is also liquid. It doesn't have color, it doesn't have order, it also falls to button, so how we will distinguish between two. So the description doesn't uh, tell exactly uh, a substance or a process. But now, today if somebody asks you what is water, you immediately will tell that, oh, water is a molecule made of hydrogen atom and one oxygen atom. So it, is for, it has a for chemical formula, H2O. Now from chemical formula, Fundamental formula you can derive all the properties of water. Such type of formula for life doesn't exist. So NASA gives us the astronomer who for habitable planet a working definition for life. And that means that life is a self-sustaining chemical system which is capable of Darwinian evolution. Now this is very small. The immediately the biologist will start jumping, this cannot say anything. Of course, it cannot say anything and moreover this is a description and a description is always incomplete and controversial. Now if you slightly, then what we will tell, we, we can tell that life is an ensemble of organic materials. Organic materials mean the material which are carbon based and which has oxygen and hydrogen as its partner, the carbon and governed by self-sustaining synchronized system of chemical processes that's the enzyme and characterized by metabolism that makes the growth of the species the replication through which a cell uh, imitate and uh, or produce exact copy of, uh, of, a, of the cell and the evolution through natural selection. Now the evolution of natural selection is very important. Otherwise, when uh, if uh, if you see one cat or one dog in Mars, you can say you can tell that because of this evolution, tell that there definitely must be many cat and dog. Otherwise, those cat and dog are transported to Mars by some uh, some other planet. Or if some extraterrestrial intelligence was watching Neil Armstrong and Edwin landing on the moon or walking on the moon, they could have told that, oh, moon, uh, life exists in moon. But it is the evolution of natural selection that tells you that 
the uh, the life it evolves from the simplest form to the complicated form this is a role played by the gene so i am not a biologist but this has given a new subject in this field astrobiology so what is this evolution it is actually a minor mistake by a gene by, but a systematic minor mistake by the gene the gene uh, which carries the information of the species in the cells it exactly replicate a cell but if it makes a little mistake now how it suppose he has the first person he has a book uh, and he has a uh, book which he has only one copy in the entire college there was no photocopier there was no camera there was no xerox copy he did that he just manually wrote all doing so he replaces a fragments from the book and then passed passed it the his copy to the next person the next person didn't know about the original copy so he also copied from his copy and while doing so he also replaced a few words and then passed his copy to the next person and this process continues. now when the last version of the book will will entire book has changed now if this book has many meaning it will survive or be thrown out so the gene may to, to adapt to the environment it makes very slow and systematic deviation uh, uh, from its uh, replication and that gives rise to evolution if the genes very rapid then without any system then we call it cancer so now the thing is that another question we do not know that what is the origin of life on earth few years a few decades ago ure and they showed that the necessary organic materials uh, was synthesized from the organ inorganic materials but then it turned out that the amino acid that uh, uh, he from the uh, inorganic material will not Uh, used by the life there there are many more uh, uh, amino acid only few particular amino acid like three amino acid guanine those are used by life still the question was there that if organic material can be on the earth itself out of the inorganic material then can life be synthesized also out of those organic material earth it this was believed for long time for decades but recent time we have got evidences from asteroid that they carries organic materials and they carries also some those um, amino acids so therefore it again uh, question that whether this organic material were which are the building block of life it was uh, not necessarily synthesized on earth must have uh, imported from outside if that is the case then is it uh, can we just rule out that life was also in a at least in its nascent form was not imported from outside to the planet and then it got very appropriate to survive and to evolve we do not know so unless and until we can uh, produce artificial life in our laboratory we just cannot say that where life uh, life was originated on earth or it has come out from outside even if we discovered life outside the planet then then also we can tell that the life is a general phenomena at least in our uh, uh, galaxy and it may be imported to a place it has appropriate condition. and now what what are these appropriate condition what has made life on earth whether it is originated on earth or it has been imported outside uh, from outside what how it has survived you will be surprised to know that there is a rare combination a coincidence of a combinatorial and astrological condition that made life uh, to survive on this planet now you see first of all the giant planets we know that the system as a particular configuration here the giant planets are outside 
of the and the rocky planets, the small planets including Earth, inside. Now here outside uh, where the Pluto uh, lives outside the Neptunian, there is a region, this is a uh, belt type of region called Fluor belt. So these are the leftover uh, material, consist of the leftover of the material which was uh, during the formation of this planet. So what happened, uh, the density was so low that this uh, small ice and rock, they could not combine gravitationally. And so they have a very small, uh, they could not uh, form a planet and they uh, just orbit the sun in small, small pieces. Now big asteroid and the uh, uh, short planets, they are the origin, the birthplace uh, this Kuiper belt is the birthplace of this uh, comets and asteroid. Now they always comes towards the sun. But because of the gravitational attraction of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, most of these comets either hit and get absorbed by the Jupiter or their path get deviates so that they cannot come, uh, many of them cannot come towards the Earth. As a consequence, the probability of the collision of comet and asteroid has reduced substantially. In fact, it is believed that 60 million years the Earth huge uh, collision with a comet and because of that the dinosaurs was and the other larger species was completely extinct. Actually the Earth several Earth the extinction several times at least five six times when the entire uh, uh, land or even the uh, water based life was completely extinct and again I formed again it evolved. Now most of the planetary system so far we have seen uh, discovered outside here the giant planets are very near to the star and we have not yet discovered the rocky planet which are outside that but in that situation you imagine that will increase the frequency of the planets and it will destroy the entire planet itself. So the configuration of solar supporting uh, on earth. Next come the terrestrial magnetic field. No earth has a magnetic field. This has been uh, used for navigation for centuries. Now the sun, it emits inert particle, charged particle. And if the magnetic field was not there, the charged particle would have entered the atmosphere. It, has, it would uh, ionize the gas, the molecules, and it could have changed the entire atmospheric composition in a possible way. Not only that, it could hit our body and completely uh, damage the cells. But because of the presence of this magnetic field, this charged particle cannot enter to the atmosphere. It can enter only through the open magnetic field line. This is because of the Lorentz force. It cannot enter to the closed field line, but it enters to the open field line, giving rise to the spectacular uh, aurora, uh, polar region. Similarly, the volcanoes and earth, you always heard that volcanoes and earthquake has a destructive effect, but you will be surprised to know that how these volcanoes and earthquake actually protecting life for uh, billions of years. Because the earth, the carbon dioxide, which plays a double role uh, in uh, maintaining the temperature of the earth. The carbon dioxide plays reflecting agent to uh, send back 30% of the starlight to the outer space. And that that's determines the albedo or the reflectivity of the earth. Thus, carbon dioxide plays a role in cooling down earth atmosphere. At the same time, the stellar light that it heats the surface the rock it warms up and the photon become the, the radiation become weaker but while it is going away from the atmosphere it cannot go so because it gets scattered with the carbon dioxide water and other molecules it gets so many times scattered multiply scattered that it cannot escape uh, to the space it just get trapped into the atmosphere and thus warming up atmosphere of the planet and that's what we call uh, greenhouse effect if we consider uh, only the stellar light, the temperature of the Earth, Jupiter, Mars, 
All will be habitable. They will lie between 15 degree to 20 degree. But because of the reflectivity, the Earth reflects 30 percent of its uh, of the sunlight to the space. The temperature should have reduced to minus 15 degree Celsius. The temperature of the Mars would have been uh, reduced even far below because it has also an albedo of 0.2 or 20 percent of the starlight uh, goes out of the space. And Venus, it has a huge point, 70 percent of the starlight it reflects out, uh, out. So it could have been much cooler. But because of this greenhouse effect, the temperature rises to minus 15 degree to mean 15 degree Celsius that has given, uh, that has the art to be habitable. Or uh, this, if this carbon dioxide, it, uh, the amount of the carbon dioxide changes, then this process will cease to act. Either earth will become cooler or it will become hotter. Now carbon dioxide mix up with the rain water and then produces carbonic acid, which is a but it falls on the rock and it mix up with the rock which is made of silicon and give thus oxide. Now if this process continues that within uh, 10 years all the carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere would have been completely gone and the earth atmosphere would have been changed. Because of an earthquake, this carbon which was combined with the silicon again uh, released out and it comes out again and within one million uh, year it forms a carbon silicon chain so that it goes mix up with the silicon through the volcano and the plate tectonic or earthquake it come out and it make the balance of the amount of carbon dioxide. At the same time, earthquake or plate tectonic and volcano that resynthesize the minerals uh, in uh, earth surface or in the earth atmosphere also. There, was, there is no volcanic or plate tectonic and that the compose the atmospheric material or the mineral in Mars is uh, as old as the time of their formation. It has recycled or uh, resynthesized. Venus's story is completely different. It has a very thick atmosphere which given a runaway greenhouse effect that made the temperature of Venus's atmosphere as high as 400 degrees Celsius and that's why although Venus is the nearest planet in the solar system, it is the hottest planet in the solar system. So this volcanoes and earthquake plays an important role in protecting life uh, on earth. The next uh, you know the earth, it is uh, orbiting, it is slightly tilted rotation axis. And because of this tilt, which is 23.4 degree, that's why we see the climate. That's why we see the we see the uh, rainy season because of this angle. Now because of this tilt, there is a precision. There is a rotation in the uh, axis. Now the same time, tilt angle, this also changes. This also varies with time. And then the orbit, the orbit around the sun, that also varies. Come, all this together give rise to a cycle called Milankovitch cycle. Now you can see that in 24,000 years, the tilt angle uh, make a uh, complete precision at the same time 41,000 years ago. So the thing is that this dynamical change, this dynamical party pattern is very small so that we don't understand there is, I mean, there is not a uh, substantial change or there is no a, uh, uh, there is no significant change in the climate of the earth over a large, uh, uh, I mean, so time period. Uh, uh, so why this is happening? Why this is, who is uh, responsible for this small uh, in the dynamics of the Earth orbits? Surprised to know that our moon, our Chandrama is helping us in protecting our atmosphere. So we have a massive moon. If moon, the, when the Earth was formed, it was orbiting with a very high velocity. One day was equivalent to almost 10 hours. 
then a mars size object called theia that collided with the earth and it the collision was uh, so strong that earth almost destroyed but somehow it managed it was in its uh, very early stage just 100 million years after it, this collision happened and out of this collision whatever has gone out of the that is orbiting the earth and that is our moon so with this collision subsequently with gravitational effect it has slowed down the orbital rotation uh, the period of uh, not orbital the rotation period of the earth and <clears throat> that has stabilized the atmosphere of the earth that if moon was not there this angle would have been very much chaotic because of the gravitational force of jupiter saturn and uranus the moon is acting as a uh, friend for top of where uh, jupiter saturn and uh, uranus and keeping this tilt angle a very small if moon was not there still tilt angle will be very high and the climate would have been very drastic in fact in mars there is no massive moon there is two uh, satellite called demos and phobos which are supposed to be uh, some asteroid small asteroid that has come with uh, uh, captured by mars so mars's tilt angle is very chaotic and therefore mars's climate is also uh, very chaotic and it is uninhabitable but our moon is protecting uh, us from this now this type of thing we cannot uh, know that uh, how to uh, because we cannot planet actually what is the environment of this planet so what the astronomers is now uh, doing to find out this life bio signature from the planet that if there is a signature of life in reflected light of the planet now what could be those bio signature so one is you know methane methane can be produced by the degradation of biomass or uh, when uh, uh, living mass dies then it causes methane but methane can be formed also through chemical processes see uh, certain thing is oxygen molecule now at the early stage of the earth, oxygen molecule was not available there was no free oxygen all the oxygen was chemically combined with carbon and other material uh, with hydrogen and uh, they formed the oxygen there was no free oxygen molecule the oxygen started producing by a bacteria cyanobacteria life came before that even when there was no oxygen there was anaiso uh, anaiso oxygen uh, <coughs> life but then the cyanobacteria they started photosynthesis they emitted a copious amount of oxygen molecule the entire environment of the earth uh, got changed the species which found oxygen genus they all changed, and the species which uh, found oxygen molecule they only survived now these oxygen molecules can serve but it is in the deeper region can serve as a bio signature now these oxygen molecules in the upper upper atmosphere when they heat by the intense solar ultraviolet ray they get dissociated into oxygen atom this oxygen atom and the oxygen molecule that combines to give rise the ozone molecule o3 which forms a protection shield to our atmosphere so if ozone layer was not there the ultraviolet the strong ultraviolet rays from the sun would have penetrated our atmosphere it would it could have dissociated uh, the molecules in the atmosphere not only that it could have uh, put huge mutation in life in living immediately cancer and life could have been completely extinct at least in the uh, ground based life could have been, uh, almost exist uh, extinct so ozone <coughs> so what is happening that not only the planet is uh, supporting the life the light it itself is also supporting for the survival now this ozone o3 the line you can see that this is this spectrum is taken from the space telescope pitzer this is venus this is earth and this is uh, mars so you can see carbon ozone is there only in earth where life exists we all know 
So our next strategy will be to find out the signature like ozone, methane, oxygen molecule. But the present we do not have ability to find out the spectrum of a planet, but for because of this subject has become so much acceptance from people like you, people are so much curious to find out if it exists or not. In future, several uh, multinational project that is uh, coming up, and uh, you can see that Hubble, Spitzer, Kepler, this is NASA uh, project has already uh, served industry. Hubble is still working. Spitzer gun test has been launched just few years. Already detected a few planets, and it will be also detecting planets like Kepler did it. Then James Webb Space Telescope, which is a six-meter class space telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope has its mirror whose diameter is two meters. The Kepler Space which has a uh, mirror, the diameter was one meter. Now JWSSB is a telescope where the, the, the diameter of the mirror is six meter, so we can penetrate different to the universe, we can see much light from a is much fainter object we can detect and we hope many planets uh, in habitable zone of in, around sun type of star can be detected by W. Now, yes, yes, European see also, also some program, Gaia has already launched, Kodat has already launched, everything is in the ground base also we are not behind. There will be several next generation ground based telescope. In fact, India is part of the telescope along with Japan, China, and uh, yeah, Japan, China, USA, and uh, Canada. There will be extra large telescope. There will be giant magnetic cloud. So, be a exciting thing. Now, <clears throat> so this is the case. Let us just see that our home looks like. From so, we have seen that how we are searching. Now here is the net. here we are sitting, we are talking. This is taken by Scap Juno, which is al already reached uh, Jupiter and taking picture. The next is, is from 1.4 billion years ago. This is taken from Cassini space scope, which uh, orbited uh, Saturn. Here you see our planet Earth. Now this is by taken by Voyager, which has uh, believed to left even solar system. It was taken 6 billion kilometer away from by Voyager 1. It, this was sent in 1977. So you can see that while searching for pl planet outside the solar system, while searching for life outside the, the solar system, we come to we have found that Earth is a very, very rare planet where all the uh, necessary condition was satisfied due to a huge coincidence and uh, it is very unlikely that there will be several such type of planet in the world. There are potential dangers also for the Earth. The collision by a asteroid may destroy it. So a supernova explosion may destroy the atmosphere. A gamma ray burst in our galaxy can also destroy completely the Earth. And a giant flare from the sun. The possibility of these effects are very rare. When there is no reason that why sun will behave like that. There is no uh, star uh, nearby, known star, burning and uh, may go into supernova explosion. But in the terrestrial, there could be a super earthquake, there could be a super tsunami or volcanoes. Those are also rare. So the unit threat comes from man-made design. The um, uh, change in environment, the increase in carbon, dioxide, even if there is a, uh, is a nuclear wear take place, the atmosphere finished, will damage irreversibly. And uh, so finally we come to why the Nobel Prize was given to Pegasi, because this discovery of 51 Pegasi confirms that the stars other than sun to have planets, the discovery initiated world search for exoplanet and the subsequent discoveries of a wide of planets revolutionize our knowledge and understanding of planetary system. The discovery rekindled the curiosity of mankind, is anybody out there? And uh, hence, it is a search for habitable planet. At the same time, the search for art uh, convinces us how rare is our own planet and life on it. 
gives us a lesson that it's the responsibility and duty of each and every citizen to protect this rarest of the rare planet so that generation to come can keep on smiling. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sujan uh, Sengupta, for the excellent talk. Um, uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, limit the question or the discussions uh, because the hall has to be readied for another meeting. But both um, Sriram and uh, Sujan will be available. Shall we meet outside? Okay, those students, uh, people who want to ask questions, okay, uh, outside we can meet and there will be a question answer session and uh, they will like to talk to the students and particularly those who want to ask questions, I am sure a lot of questions will be there. Sorry for this slight confusion in the uh, program uh, because we have to hand over the hall to the next meeting which is supposed to start at 6 o'clock and we have only 10 minutes for them to clean this place. Okay? Uh, is there anything uh, specifically? Okay, we'll go on. Uh, only two announcements. Uh, please hand over your feedback form to the uh, desk outside. Second thing, I request all of you to become member of Tamil Nadu Science Forum. Uh, because we are organizing such kind of lectures continuously at one point of time we have to be replaced by somebody else who are sitting here. Please become a member of Science, Tamil Nadu Science Forum. We are in, running two magazines, one is Jantar Mantar in English, another one is in Tamil, Tulir. So you can subscribe these uh, two magazines as well. Thank you very much.